Hi folks, so this is me. I'm Matt Jarvis. I'm a senior developer advocate at Sneak. And Sneak are a cloud native application security company. Um, I've been around open source for a pretty long time. And I've kind of worked both sides of this um, ops dev uh, kind of boundary. So when you start scanning your container images, it can be disconcerting to discover that you might have large numbers of vulnerabilities in your images. This is a scan I did last week on a vulnerable node image that I built. It's a fairly extreme example, but you can see that this image out of the box is showing as having uh, nearly 900 vulnerabilities in it. So faced with this, many of us will just freeze like a rabbit in headlights when we get presented with a big list like that, uh, particularly if our focus is on application development and not system administration. Uh, what are we supposed to do with this information and where do we start? I just wanted an image to run my node application in and already I'm facing this gigantic task to make it secure. Well, the most important thing we need to remember is that fixing these things in containers is not like fixing them in virtual machines. Uh, we're not going to get into upgrading individual packages and starting to manage the whole system. We need to understand where vulnerabilities have got into our images before we can think about what strategies we use um, to remediate them. Uh, what we don't want to do is to have to read through all these vulnerabilities, understand what they're doing, or to become uh, too versed in the art of system administration. We're looking for solutions which align with the paradigms of containers. So we want repeatability, um, efficiency, uh, and as much as possible to stick uh, with the ideas of immutability that come along with how we use containers. The first thing that's worth talking about in this context is how the images we're using might be constructed. Our Docker images are made up of layers and those layers are coming from different places. Uh, some of them we're creating in our own Docker files. Some of them are being brought in as part of our build process. And depending on how we construct our Docker file, we'll end up with these things kind of separated into separate file system layers in our Docker image. And this layering kind of gives us a good analogy in terms of how we should be thinking about vulnerabilities. It's likely that we started from a base image in our Docker file using the from statement. And then we added some of our own things during the build process. Perhaps we made some configuration changes for our environment, and then we added our own custom software. Now, although we refer to this as our base image, it's likely that the image we're using is also constructed from a parent image, which then had software installed into it during its own build process. The parent image itself was then constructed in some way, perhaps even from a further parent image, or by some kind of root file system building tool. Understanding how the software that we're scanning got into our images in the first place is really the key to deciding on our strategy for minimizing vulnerabilities. As an example of this, let's uh, look at the official um, Nginx image on Docker Hub. And if we look at the Docker file for this image, we could see it's based on the Debian Buster Slim image, which then gets software and configuration added to it when the Nginx image is built. And in turn, the Debian Buster image is built from another Docker file, which takes an empty scratch image and adds a tarball to it. And if we then research how this tarball gets built, it's an output from this Debera type tool, which is a series of scripts used by the Debian project to build root file systems. This is obviously the way that Debian do it, and there are different methods by which these things get constructed for all of the other operating systems which are typically used as base images. And the point of all of this is that even when we just look at our base images, the way that software gets into them can be a long and potentially convoluted process. And that can be difficult to follow unless you understand all these different paradigms. Now, some might say that you should just use Scratch and build your own images, starting from basically an empty container. 
Well, this might work well for compiled language binaries where we don't have any dependencies, Go or C, for example. But for most other things, you'll end up being the maintainer for everything that goes into that image. And that can be a very big overhead on an ongoing basis. So unless you want to become the maintainer of an entire base image, in most cases, you're going to want to trust an upstream provider for your base images and look to them for fixes to vulnerabilities in the base image you're using. Really don't try to fix upstream issues downstream. As soon as you do this, you effectively become the maintainer. So as we've seen, in order to use upstream images, we need to trust the entire chain of build processes which went into the image we're consuming. And that can be tricky to follow clearly. Of course, this isn't any different from how we consume the majority of open source software. And many of the same quality factors that might influence our choices there also apply here. Is the software maintained and updated regularly? Is there a broad community of users? Are there commercial companies supporting it? This information is all available to you online, so just take your time, investigate what it is that you're actually using. By trusting our upstream image provider, we really need to rely on pulling in vulnerability fixes from upstream by upgrading our base image or by using a different base image which might have less vulnerabilities in it. But picking a base image isn't always as easy as it looks. For example, the official Ruby base image in Docker Hub has lots of vulnerabilities in it, and it's really big. And this is fairly typical of official runtime images. Um, by design, they need to be generalized for every use case. Uh, we could look at the slim version. It's smaller, has less vulnerabilities, or perhaps we look for another one. But there are lots and lots of tags in this repository. How do we choose? Well, generic's probably not what you want for production use cases. It's hard to tell which framework version they might be following. That could change in the future. But slim isn't always the best choice. You may get less vulnerabilities, but then you might need to start managing all the build dependencies if you're using this to build your, your, uh, your images. So the best practice in this case is to use multi-stage builds. And we're not going to go into um, detail in this talk about that, but basically use the bigger, more generic image to do our software builds and then copy our build artifacts over into our slim version for production deployment. In this way, we're not having to manage the build dependencies and we still get to take advantage of the size and reduced vulnerabilities of the slim version. Note here, we're also sticking to specific runtime versions. So we know exactly which runtime environment we're getting and we know it's not gonna change under us. So in terms of choosing our base images, here's some general recommendations. Trust an upstream provider to do the heavy lifting and vulnerability fixing for you. They have bigger teams working on this stuff and so are much more likely to be fixing things uh, quickly. Pin your applications to versioned images, you know, at least the major version, probably the minor version. And that way the ground won't shift under you in the future. Learn to love multi-stage builds so you can use slim images in deployment while still taking advantage of proven combinations in build. And rebuild often. Lots of times this will get you security fixes just as part of the build process and consider moving your pins every once in a while. Upgrading to new versions will also bring in um, more security fixes. So you can also leverage the tools you're just using to scan your container images. And uh, this is the same container scanned in Sneak. And where I've also provided the Docker file that was used to build the container. And so here Sneak's able to show us a range of base image upgrades and alternative images which can reduce the number of vulnerabilities in our uh, base image. And the data backs these assertions up from the data we've gathered at Sneak from the millions of container image scans that we've seen on our platform. Over 40% of Docker image vulnerabilities can usually be fixed by upgrading the base image. And uh, over 20% can be fixed just by rebuilding since a lot of containers will um, upgrade software during the, during the build process. 
So now we've looked at the base images which you might be using. And um, what about the things we're adding to the containers ourselves? Um, perhaps we're installing additional software from upstream and we've got custom applications of our own, which might have their own dependencies also being installed. For our own applications, um, modern applications are typically based on a pretty small amount of homegrown code and lots of third party modules or libraries, um, usually open source. And this is a pattern you'll be familiar with if you're developing in Java, in Node, in Python, in Go. And each of those things those that we bring in as dependencies can have a large dependency tree, both in terms of things they directly depend on and indirect dependencies, so dependencies of our dependencies. And this can potentially bring in a, a ton of other code, which we might not be even, uh, even be aware of. And these can be a very large source of, of vulnerabilities. Now, using these isn't a bad thing. We're having reusable code means we write less code. We don't have to reinvent the wheel and we can spend more time on the functionality we need. But we do need to be aware of what's going on in our image. So there are a couple of different ways we can um, deal with vulnerabilities introduced um, here, depending on the tools we're using. Uh, here we're looking at a sneak scan of that same container image we started with. And here Sneaks identified the package.json for our application, which contains the application dependencies. Um, and it's f discovered that inside our image. So it gives us a clear picture of which uh, vulnerabilities are coming from the base image and which are coming from the dependencies of our applications. But we can also combine our container image scanning with scanning our application code directly in our source code management systems before it gets included in our base images. And again, this is a scan from Sneak, um, not only identifying those vulnerabilities in the package.json, so our, our node packages, but it's also picked up the vulnerabilities that would be in the base image by scanning the Docker file. So by combining this source code management level of scanning with our container image scans, we can more clearly identify the source of those particular vulnerabilities. Whichever way you end up separating out those vulnerabilities is probably not realistic except for uh, very simple applications to expect your container image to have no vulnerabilities at all. So we have to make judgment calls on which ones to fix and which ones we might just accept. We don't have endless resources available to spend on fixing these things. And so we need to prioritize. Unless we want to start digging into every vulnerability and understanding the specific circumstances under which we might be vulnerable, then really we have to decide on a strategy. And context matters when we start thinking about prioritizing things. And prioritization is not an exact science. It can be based on a number of different factors. Um, severity alone doesn't give us very much information other than potential impact. The CVSS score that takes into account things like exploitability does give us more context. But we can also use information like the maturity of available exploit code. And more importantly, if a fix is available, high severity vulnerabilities which have an exploit and a fix are kind of a no brainer to fix first. And understanding the output of our tools is also critical here. We need to be able to filter those lists of vulnerabilities uh, based on the, so we only see the things that we care about. If there are vulnerabilities which don't have a fix, for example, then we might want to filter those out since they aren't actually actionable. So a reasonable strategy might be something like this. No high severity CVEs in production, nothing with a mature exploit, and to apply all patches which exist. And if you followed this, it would likely drastically reduce your overall vulnerability count in, uh, in most cases. So let's recap on this a bit and work through an example of how we might go about starting to think in layers about addressing fixes. So firstly, choose a base image. This is maintained by somebody else. And so we want to pull our fixes and the base image in from our upstream provider. And inside our organization, we might have a set of 
uh, common configuration specific to our environment. And we might want to include um, security hardening uh, packages to that. So perhaps we maintain our own base image based off that upstream image, which includes this common set. Since we're adding this, we can focus on fixes in this small subset of software that we're managing. We might then have a set of standard middleware. And again, we can treat that as a separate layer and manage that for vulnerabilities um, separately. And then finally, our application that just contains our custom code and its dependencies. And so if we uh, look at our layers like this, we can see various different ways that we might be able to um, organize around this. If we're a small organization, um, perhaps we have one team that's managing all those different layers. And depending on the size of your uh, organization, perhaps you have a base image team, which uh, provides that standard set of approved base images. And we might also have a, um, a, a, a separate team which deals with the uh, with the middleware and with the um, common configuration. And when we look at fixing these things, what we want to be able to do is to just address a vulnerability once and kind of have it resolved everywhere. And so it's very important that we understand where these vulnerabilities, in which layers these vulnerabilities um, exist. So if we've started from our own base image, we can see here we're basing on uh, um, the upstream Python 360 Slim, and we're gonna uh, uh, um, install here our, uh, whatever that, that, that critical hardening package is and our common configuration is. And this builds the base image for our organization. Once we've built this, we can establish a baseline. So we can scan this image for vulnerabilities. In this case, we can see we've got 178 um, issues there. And we're gonna, uh, for the, the purposes of, of, uh, of this example, um, uh, we'll assume that these are, are, are non-fixable. So this will be our, our baseline. But it's important that we also watch out for um, new vulnerabilities coming into our base images. So when images are released on things like Docker Hub or, or uh, any of the other um, package repositories, uh, they would tend to have uh, no fixable vulnerabilities. But um, that can change over time. So it would be very good practice to rebuild and set a new baseline um, on a fairly uh, regular basis. So then using that base image, we could then construct our middleware image. So perhaps we're going to um, include, use the base image as our, uh, with our from directive and then add uh, a standard set of, of middleware packages. And at this stage, we can test our middleware image and we can see that we've only uh, actually gained another two vulnerabilities from the 178 issues that we had in our base image. So we now know that whoever's responsible for our middleware image only really has to focus on those two because the uh, previous um, vulnerabilities were all in the base image. And we can see when we look at the scans for this, that uh, we've got that clear separation from the things that were in the base image to things that were in the middleware. And then finally, we can use that middleware image in order to build our application, adding our um, custom code into it. And if we then scan that, we can see that actually our application team doesn't have any vulnerabilities to worry about because they're all um, uh, vulnerabilities which were in the previous um, image. So by separating out things and being very clear about where the boundaries of responsibility between those layers lie, it does make it a lot easier for our uh, teams to be able to focus on which things they should um, fix first. But as with all these things, it's important to remember that fixing vulnerabilities uh, doesn't exist in, in isolation. Our um, container images 
uh, almost never run um, on their own. They, you know, were usually running as, as part of a, an orchestration system. And most exploits are actually a combination of application level vulnerabilities and um, system level misconfigurations. So it's very important that we combine our container image scanning with also looking at the security configuration for things wherever we're going to be running our images. So whether that's Kubernetes or, or any other orchestration platform. So conclusions um, from uh, this and things to, to go away uh, thinking about. Um, Define your trust boundaries. So understand um, what you're going to uh, rely on your upstream provider for and which bits you're actually responsible for. Decide on a strategy. Have a plan for um, which things you're going to uh, fix, which things you're going to um, uh, accept. Leverage your tooling. You know, security tools have uh, lots of features that allow you to be able to um, filter and to uh, enrich the amount of information you have to base your decisions on. And start with the low hanging fruit. Things which have fixes available are really a no brainer to accept those fixes and pull them into your images. So thank you for listening. Um, you can sign up for a free sneak account at sneak.io slash sign up. And if you're interested in the combinations of Sneak and Docker, uh, you can take a 10 minute online um, Sneak and Docker uh, lab, or you can check out um, more useful Sneak and Docker resources uh, on our website.